Hello, everyone. I'm Marilyn Turkovich, Executive Director for the Charter for Compassion. And this is part of our city series, Compassionate Cities. And this month, we are featuring Belfast. And so I'm pretty excited to have Frank Libby here, who is really the founder of Compassionate Belfast. And he has a wonderful team that he'll probably be referring to throughout uh, this conversation and presentation uh, that are really helping to move uh, Compassionate Belfast to a new level. And the person who's going to be the facilitator today is Leanne Rubenstein. And Leanne is from Compassionate uh, Atlanta. And I'm going to let her introduce both herself and then Frank, and then they're going to take it away from there. Please, if you have any questions, uh, you can use either the chat box, but you'll see that you have an icon for questions and answers. So you can also use that icon to write in what that might be. Thank you both for coming and I'll turn it over to Leanne. Okay, so I'm going to start with my mask on because I want you to see it. It says Compassion in Atlanta, and then it says the time is now. The funny thing is somebody said, if you're reading this mask, you're too close. So we got other mm -hmm. ones that didn't have as much writing, but the time is definitely now. And I am so grateful to be a part of this call. Thank you, Marilyn. I am the co-director of Compassion in Atlanta. I'm sitting outside here at a lake with the birds singing. If they get too loud, let me know. I'll put myself on mute when, when Frank is talking. Um, but basically, Compassion in Atlanta is a grassroots movement. We were born out of the Charter for Compassion. We work on several different things, but we connect with other organizations and connect people to organizations. We create our own programming and we do a lot of consulting. What does it mean to be compassionate in our world today? So I'm grateful to be here. And one of those new connections is with Frank. Um, and I want Frank, I think Frank, I would introduce you, but I think what I'm gonna do is just start with a question to you about how you got involved in this work. And by that, tell us a little bit about your history and background. Thank you, Leon, and uh, also thank you, Marlon. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Frank Liddy, and I'm the co-founder of Compassion City Belfast, and that's Belfast, Ireland. So a bit of a lightning tour. So Compassion City Belfast was born in the year 2013. Uh, so we're just going into our, our eighth year at the moment. But then what brought me to the charter was going away back, away back a good 40, 50 years, you know, whenever we're going through the difficult times here in the north of Ireland with the hunger strikes, which are being you know, remembered at this time of year, you know, is that whenever Mother Teresa was in Belfast and she was asked, you know, when would there be peace in Ireland? Her reply was when people had suffered enough. Now, whenever I heard Mother Teresa say that all those years ago, you know, I was quite sort of shocked. But, you know, from, you know, going through the troubles, you know, that we've gone through here in, uh, in, in Belfast, you know, I realise and understand that, yes, and there's also a way to alleviate suffering, and the way to alleviate that suffering is through compassion, yeah? You know, we know that, we know now through science that, you know, if I help someone, I'm also help myself. So there is no step separation and there is no other. So I would say then, Leon, you know, looking way back, through the 80s and through the, definitely through the 80s and through the 90s and right into the noughties, that there was always a genuine interest for to look at a middle way, another way that people could explore their differences. And I believe that when it comes to compassion and we put compassion onto, onto, the, onto the table, and once we sort of uh, you know, do our best then with our own curiosity to explore you know, what is compassion, we find that there's no difference you know, whether it be, uh, you know, one side of the community or the other side of the community. In actual fact, I believe that compassion itself, you know, is the heart of our city. You know, the great uh, Karen Armstrong, which was here in Belfast a few years back, said that a compassionate city is an uncomfortable city. Yeah. So I think it's been able then to bring that conversation to the table and then for people to explore in ways that we can work together in 
alleviate suffering, to separate the other as such, and then to be able to integrate within the community a new language, a new language. And I believe that that language would be the language of the heart. And the language of the heart to me would be compassion. Then, you know, shooting forward to 2013, you know, we had a great mayor here in Belfast uh, called Marshall O'Miller and the great uh, Reverend Bill Shaw, Dr. Bill Shaw and myself, you know, approached City Hall with the charter. Uh, the mayor at that time, uh, Marshall O'Miller, you know, took it on board. We ran it through council and the good news is that the city endorsed the Charter for Compassion, you know, which was, I mean, for us, that was, that was amazing. You know, now here we have you know, our own Belfast City Council, you know, reaching out and embracing the, the Charter. Now, since 2013, we've started a series of conversations in north of the city, of south of the city, of east and west of the city. And then around about 20, 2015, 2016, you know, we had the great uh, meeting with uh, Jim Doty, Dr. Jim Doty based in Stanford University. You know, and anybody who's, you know, looking in, listening in, you know, Jim has written a fantastic book and that is Into the Magic Shop. And again, you know, that addresses compassion. And he's also the director of the Seacare Centre in Stanford University. So right up until last year, you know, uh, Jim, myself and a few others have been working on bringing 400 neuroscientists to Belfast and we we're going to have a conference, a four-day conference, two days in Queen's University, which is the beautiful building behind me, and two days within the greater city. And we're going to be looking at the neuroscience of compassion, the neuroscience of compassion. The two days in the university would have been two days of academia, and the two days in the community was going to reach out to the community, it was going to reach out to look at uh, compassion and addiction, compassion and homelessness, uh, compassion and restorative justice, uh, compassion in the arts, compassion within schools. You know, there was a list, a great list of activities that were going to take place over the two days. But unfortunately, due to the pandemic and due to our good friend COVID-19, we had to put that on hold. It was going to roll out there on October 23rd of last year. So what we're doing at the moment is we hope to run a webinar within the next couple of months, just to keep, you know, keeping it fresh in the mind of people here in Belfast. And then hopefully, uh, whenever we're able to be back out in uh, in the real world again, that we'll be able to, to host the conference once again back in Belfast sometime soon. Well, Frank, that's that's a lot. That's a lot of information, a lot of work. I think people know of Belfast in in some sense in their minds, but don't always know the struggles that Belfast has gone through. And um, so I guess what I want to say is I'm from the south of the United States, right? And so we come also from a place of a lot of struggle. Um, the, the civil rights movement was born here, or, or some of the leaders were born here, right? And yet the struggle still continues. And what I find is that people really are hungry for compassion. People are hungry to find a way so that when they think about their city, they think about it in a broader way. How has the community responded to the types of things that you've been bringing these conversations into the community? Thanks, Leon, and uh, a great question. You know, we're in a we're in a, in a perfect you know position here at the moment with our post conflict and the post conflict sort of resolution. So for me, you know. Compassion and the seed of compassion has already given birth here in, in Belfast. You know, because we're now looking at, at a new language for a new Belfast. Yeah, a new language for a new Belfast and a language, you know, that a language that embraces everyone, irrespective of color, class, creed. And so whenever we would approach uh, people within different different sides of the of the community, right? No one to date, no one to date has opposed the discussion of compassion. And it seems to me that compassion is that passport to the heart. There's something for me that when it comes to, uh, to get a, a compassionate conversation, that people like what you said within, the, within uh, Atlanta, there is a thirst there and there's a hunger there, you know, then there has to be a way. So for us here in Belfast, we're now looking at this beautiful new blank canvas, you know, 
we're now in a place that we've never been in before, right? So it's about a future. Uh, you know, on our board is a great man called John Paul Adrack. I'm sure you might have heard of John Paul. And John Paul says, what we need to do is we need to remember the future. We need to remember the future. You know? and, uh, and that to me is, is mighty. So reaching out, you know, there's a, as what uh, Marlon touched on before, Marlon's been over here a couple of times. She's met up with, you know, uh, the mayor of the time. There was Mayor Nicola Mullen, uh, a great mayor. She met up with, with Martin. She met up with a host of other people as well. You know, here in Belfast, and Marley can also like point out that there is, you know, a need that has to be addressed, and that emptiness, I would say, comes from our troubled mind. You know, because of the of the troubles that we've been through. You know, I mean, the troubles for me equals trauma. So we have experienced a lot of trauma, and that trauma needs to be addressed. That trauma needs to be talked about, and I would think that the solve for that for that trauma is compassion. To be kinder, softer, gentler, you know, to be able to be more open, right? To be able to be more open uh, to each other. And therefore, together, we can go forward. Beautiful. So you've also connected with, um, you know, sometimes what I, uh, we think about compassion, those of us who are doing this work every single day, it, it can feel like we're in a little bit of a silo or who else is doing this work? But they're actually amazing. As you've mentioned, some of them, Marilyn have put them in, has put them in the chat. They're amazing individuals who are working on this. And I think compassion and the science of compassion is becoming talked about more. It's not so woo-woo as one of my board members would say. There's a science behind it. So will you tell us about some of the different groups? Like when I mentioned Tim Harrison and I mentioned... Michael Carlin, you had met them all. These are these are folks from Emory and Life University that are doing training on compassion. Can you tell us a little bit more about that or how that manifests itself in your work? Maybe a good place to start here would be the conference that was supposed to take place in, uh, in October last year. That was the new sense of compassion. And in Belfast, we have a saying, and the saying is, Keep her lit, keep her lit. You know, the great Van Morrison, Sir Van Morrison, you know, his last book that he brought out was called Keep Her Lit. And what I had brought to, uh, to the board was that if you have one candle that's lit and the other candle that's not lit, and one candle lights the other candle, the flame of that candle does not diminish. You with me? So there's something for me, uh, Leon, about the work that we're able then to, to light up others, you know, people that, to pass that on. And compassion, as you, we all know, that does not include ourselves, is that compassion. So it's not as if, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to experience compassion fatigue. You know, I think that's been edited out of our dictionary here in, in Belfast, because true compassion is one, taking good care of oneself. You know, like if you're on an airplane and the cabin crew says, in the event of the plane going down, down comes the mask, put the mask on here first, yep. Yeah? And then, you know, ten to other passengers. So I would say that that mask that we need to wear here in Belfast and throughout the globe, you know, is the mask of compassion, you know, and to take that journey from here to here. You know? Because it is the language of the heart. And it is, you know, it brings about that presence that I find that others also, you know, understand, you know, whether it be from, uh, whether it be from, you know, an empathic response, but there seems to be a place where we can go to, which I would describe as not knowing. I think in the past we always felt that we needed to know there had to be an answer, but now because of this blank canvas, right? Because of the blank canvas, we're now able to realize and stand you know, in the knowledge that we don't know. You know what I? You know, so this is, this is, this is what T.S. Eliot spoke about. At the end of all our searching, we will return to where we began and we'll, we'll, we will see it as if for the first time. Yeah. So we've been through what we've been through, right? But now we can go forward in a new way together, not separate, but together. 
You know, it, it makes me think about a training that I did the other day, and I think this is used often in the community, um, people with disabilities, and they talk of gifts of the hands, gifts of the heart, gifts of the mind, and gifts of suffering. And so what, you know, those gifts of suffering, it, it sounds counterproductive, right? But in many ways, that suffering, and there are many gifts, they're gifts of our ancestors, right? But that, so when we did that activity, and those of us new to it, were like gifts of suffering, really, you're going to ask me that question. And yet, at the end, we were all in a very different place, because we had recognized what that suffering had taught us, and, and how that self compassion to the suffering was critical to our growth and our movement forward. Um, so let me let me ask you about. We all exist within communities, within cities, municipalities, and you have really made some inroads there uh, with the municipalities and with them understanding that this can be a way forward. Will you tell us a little bit more about how you? created that space? Well, I would, to be honest, I would say, Leon, that the key to the doors that have opened here in Belfast for me, you know, that key has come from the Charter, the Charter for Compassion. I mean, because no matter where I go, no matter where I go, you know, that, uh, you know, everybody sees the Charter, right, as a new path, a new pathway. And it's a pathway of possibilities. And I, and I then go back to what you said to Leon, no, now that we know about the science behind compassion, you know, as what your one of your board members have said, no, it's not sort of woo-hoo or it's not fluffy. You know, this is the real thing, right? And when it comes to compassion, compassion is the real thing. Yeah, it is the real thing. And I think we've been sold so many uh, dummies in the past, right? You know, oh, here's just another plaster to hoover the crack, you know so when it comes to the suffering, we're very good at avoiding our own suffering, you know, and we can go to rescue others and to alleviate their suffering. But it seems to me that through compassion and through a compassionate practice, then we're able to sit with our compassion. You know, we're able to sit with our, with our suffering. We're able then to lean into our own pain. You with me? Yep. And that in itself, that in itself is liberating. Mm -hmm. And I also love, you know, the quote of Tara Brack when it comes to radical compassion. I think, you know, today, whenever I look at radical compassion, and especially here in Ireland, you know, that is the most revolutionary act that one can do. That is the most revolutionary act that one can do. So, yes, going from the days of maybe people, you know, looking upon sort of compassion as being, you know, a bit hippie or a bit fluffy or a bit flowery, right? Denied to realise and to understand, you know, that it's real, yep, mm -hmm. and then it's radical, and that it brings about changes, and it brings about radical changes, because the world that we're in today, and let's use this pandemic to go from being locked down to be able then to open up, yeah, to be able to open up during lockdown, and then to discover, just like the flowers behind me, right, the fragrance of compassion. You with me? Yep. Yeah. We'll come back to come back to that, you know, one candle lighting the other candle. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, I think that's a great analogy because you know, people then sort of pick up on it. So it's not as if like, you know, oh, I have given too much. You know, when you feel as if you've given too much, give a bit more. Mm -hmm. You know, in the world of Zen, in the world of Zen, they say when you get to the top of the mountain, start climbing. Yep. You know, and we know, we know now through the charter, which is great, you know, I mean, that we have that template, yep. But we know now that through the charter that there is a way, yeah. you know, and if the charter, if the charter is the recipe, yep, the people are the ingredients. Beautiful, I love that. And, and I, I agree with you that having the charter behind us or with us or in front of us gives us, um, what I love is this is a global movement. Yes. So here I am sitting in Atlanta, and there you are sitting in Belfast um, and we're connected in a new way. 
And the charter gives us that ability to connect with people around the world, around the globe, and to also realize that we're all working on our own stuff. And we can work on our own stuff. We can look so different in all the different communities because we work on what that community is talking about and is facing and, you know. So has there anything been, uh, you've been doing this work for a long time, of course. Is there anything that's been surprising to you? I would say the most surprising thing to me, Leon, is how receptive people are. Mm. I mean, you know, I spoke to people in the past and I remember, I remember they had that attitude as well of like, I mean, oh, well, you know, that's a wee bit fluffy or whatever, right? But when you bring it into the room, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like, you know, the elephant in the room, yep. Mm -hmm. So when you, bring it in, when you bring it into the room, right? You know, people talk about a sense of safety, a sense of being secure, and almost as if it's a sense of them coming home. Yeah. It's almost as if, you know, compassion towards itself is bringing the mind home, the mind and heart, the mind and heart, and the mind and heart of the community, to be able to be, to be open up. Because you know what I know, we all know that trauma closes us down. Yeah. Yeah. So with the last 20 years of, 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 of great peace, you know, just like the beautiful flowers behind me, what happens is now people are starting to open up. Mm -hmm. I love the sound of the birds. <laughs> you didn't, you, there's a blue heron sitting in front of me. I wish you could, I should turn oh, my camera around, but it's really beautiful. And, it's my, and I think- my favorite, It's my favorite bird. It is. Okay, I'll turn the camera around shortly. Please but do. what what a, okay, okay, let me let me turn it around now. Why not? Can I? Okay, here. Um I don't know if I can get I'm gonna get close to it. Can we do this on a call, Marilyn? This is so unorthodox. Um, you can you can oh. do it and I can I can see it. Yeah. You're okay, can you it. see it? Yes. 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 Yeah. Closer, is. closer, closer, closer. Closer, closer. I don't want to scare him away. No. How's that? Very good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just How's hold that them beautiful there. bird? Just hold them there. Oh, fantastic. Yes. That's so as, as we're watching this beautiful bird, I think what this, what this signifies to me is to notice. Yes. Notice what's happening around you. Okay. Here I am. I'm working. I'm on this call. It's very important that I pay attention. And yet I'm mo <laughs> noticing the beauty around me which I think you have, you have done that. You have done that with your community, right? Oops, I stopped my video instead of turning around. So, so you are helping people recognize the beauty that is within is what I really hear as part of your message. It's that we have to work on ourselves. Great time. Yeah. But, yeah. but in order to work, and also and Leon, in order to work on ourselves, you mean, you know, we must reach out to others. Mm -hmm. We must reach out to others. And then go back to that sort of analogy of the, of the flower opening. You know, I think that's where we are in the history of Ireland at the moment. In the history of, of Ireland at the moment, where, you know, we're beginning then to open up to new ideas. Mm -hmm. We're starting to open up to new ideas. We're starting to open up to new ways. We're starting to, you talked about noticing there, right? You know, not only do we notice, but we also hear Mm -hmm. what the other they're also be able to hear mm -hmm. what the mm -hmm. others are saying mm -hmm. so so are you doing are you having conversations now is that part of what you do that's what we do and uh, i just need to run through our great board we just meet every mm -hmm. wednesday we just had a meeting before this great meeting with your okay. good self and marlon we have uh joanne barnes from queen's university shauna smith from queen's university We've got Kira Harkin from Queen's University. We've got uh, Siobhan Casey from HNI. We've got uh, Tim Chapman, who is the sort of daddy of restorative justice here, community restorative justice. And he's also a uh, professor emeritus of the uh, European restorative justice. Uh, we've got, as I mentioned earlier on, John Paul Lederach. And last but not least, we have the great David Gavahan. Yeah. So what a great team, what a fantastic team. Uh, what a bunch of visionaries, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we've been going for a while now and, uh, you know, and these guys are in for the long haul. 
And that's what I love. Do you know what I mean? And they are as fresh today as we were back at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, so what we're, what we're doing at the moment is we're going out and about and we're starting to interview people in, on the streets, you know, just to get that sort of vox pop of what does compassion mean to you? So if I was to ask, if I was to ask you, Leon, without putting on the spot, if I say compassion, what does it mean to you? That's a good question. I would say compassion is feeling with another and doing something about that feeling. And, and I know that oftentimes we say suffering, feeling for the suffering of another. Um, I don't always use that term suffering because I feel like people think suffering is the depth and darkest place. And yet it's, it's really, it can be, you know, that kid in middle school who's getting bullied, that's suffering. It can be your neighbor who's having a hard time paying their bills, that's suffering. It can be someone who's lonely because of COVID, that's suffering. So, so I, don't, I tend to not use that word, but I think it is connecting with another. I think it's really about, I don't know how short you wanted me to be, but I think it's about common humanity. And if we, in compassion, if, if, if I had to boil it down to two words, I'd say it's common humanity. If we can see ourselves in the other, then how would, how would we react to that? And that I think breaks everything down is that common humanity piece. Beautifully said, beautifully said. And how would you define compassion? Compassion to me is to know what to do and to know how to do it, mm. right? Without getting caught up in should I, should I not, will I, will I not? You know, so it's not, it's not the tail wagging the dog, you know? Compassion, you know, especially radical compassion is, is, is active, it's action. Yes. So it's about, it's about taking action because mm-hmm. you do know what to do because you do see the pain. I mean, I was, I was listening to a, a talk the other night and in the talk, I don't know if it came from Seeker, but you know, one of the oldest you know, parts of the brain is like a compassion center. Mm-hmm. It's a compassion center. And then, so if I seen, say you suffering, that activates that part of the brain. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yep. So it's almost as if we are called, you know, we are called to reach out to alleviate suffering. Yep. So I would say that, uh, you know, the beauty about, about compassion, my understanding of it would be constant thought of others. Yep. Constant thought of others. Because I know sometimes that my pain and my suffering comes from an attachment to a self that doesn't exist, mm-hmm. that comes to a story that doesn't exist. I remember working with a young woman who's in recovery. And whenever I met her up in the North Antrim coast in a beautiful place, you know, she came from a very, 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 very privileged background, a very privileged background. And she was offered heroin. And she thought that someone of her pedigree would not become an addict. She thought that addicts were other people, but not her. She took the heroin. She became an addict. She lost everything, you know, family, friends, respect, dignity. She became homeless. Yep. And then she got clean. And this is what she told me. She says, only one thing made her happy, the needle. And now that that was gone, everything made her happy. You know what I mean? And sometimes, you know, I, I look upon you know, our addiction to self, once we're able to set that aside, you with me, right? Then we can truly see, you know, we can truly see, you know, with a much broader lens, you know, the selfish lens is like so, yep, you know, a broader lens. So let's, let's all, let's all open up, you know, we just need to open up. We need to talk about what we can't talk about. We need to be heard, yep. We need to be understood. And sometimes we just need to tell the story. That's all. Sometimes you know, was, was, it, was, it, was it Einstein who said, either you don't believe in miracles or you think everything's a miracle? <laughs> I, think. I like it. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Marilyn, you're there. Will you come on and tell us how you define compassion? I'm putting you on the spot. 
Okay, you can put me on the spot. I, I mean, I, I have a feeling. I have a feeling you've been asked this question before, and, and I think both of you answered the question uh, really well. And um, you know, I I've been as as Frank has said, I've been to Belfast a number of times, and I've seen compassion in action in Belfast. Um, and I'm just wondering, Frank, uh, and I'm not trying to get out of answering the question, <laughs> but I, I wanted people to hear of some of the, the work that you very specifically are doing. Like, I know how proud you are of the park, the garden. And oh, yes. um, <laughs> see, you forgot. Um, oh, so I'm, I'm wondering if you could share the, uh, you know, how that came to be how, you know, we can even reflect how it might happen in other cities around the world, but what did it take uh, to create that space? Well, uh, everyone, the beautiful garden, and I, I should get a photograph for you, send that to you quite soon, because, you know, it's not the garden that you've seen back then. So the beautiful garden came about <clears throat> that we were looking for, a garden of compassion. No way we, no way you have like sort of a, a remembrance garden, whatever, right? But for us, it was more about, about compassion. Uh, we went to the council, you know, looking for, for a, a place. And there was this old garden in the city centre that wasn't used, wasn't used at all. Uh, it was quite dark and the hedges were, were very, very tall and, you know, and they weren't, were definitely, they weren't never taken care of. And, you know, sad to say that it became then the habitat for people to go into and to, to check up you know, with, with Herman. And therefore, you know, people in that area would not go through the park, they would always just walk around the park. So then we brought together all the people in that area around the park and the park is called the Crescent. Yeah? And we brought everybody around the park and we had a discussion about, about the park and opening up the park. And the good news is that again, you know, everybody was on board, especially the birds. And I have to bring in the birds, our little feather friends. Because, because of the nesting season, right? Work had to be carried out before nesting season, right? So rather than being put back a year, <clears throat> because of the, our good friend, the birds, then what happened was it was brought forward in time. So the hedges were all taken away. All the railings were, were repainted. We had extra seating put in. We've had the old lighting, which was like lighting go back to, you know, maybe the late 18th century, you know what I mean? Uh, so that's been relit again. Uh, the, the beautiful, the beautiful you know, grass area. And we also then had flower pots put in. We had, uh, we had flowers, flower uh, baskets hanging from, the, from the, the, the lamps as well put in. And we have a beautiful friend, your friend of mine, uh, Marlon, and that is the beautiful poet Naomi Shihad Nye. So Naomi Hisehab Nye has dedicated her poem, Kindness, to the garden. So we're, we're looking to get kindness then to be printed onto, onto a stone, to have that sort of, you know, permanent structure, uh, that it would be a garden of compassion, a garden of kindness. Also, what's in, what we have on plan is that in the middle of the garden, we'll have like a, a large sand pit. And within the large sand pit, it'd be almost like a Zen garden, right? A Zen garden. Uh, but there would be wooden wooden rakes for children to come along, right? And then they're able to rake through the sand, but they'll bring up history from the past. You with me? Yeah. So therefore, we'll be able to rake up the past, right? With these young people from all parts of Belfast, they will come together to rake up the past, right? And then in doing so, being able then to, to be curious, right? To, to be curious as to that that was the way it was. How could people be that way? And we may never, ever, ever go back that way. Yeah. You know, Frank, I'm wondering if you could share with people, um, how difficult was it to get together these coffee houses? I, I remember one of the times that I was there, we flitted from one to the other, uh, where you would have these conversations across yes. uh, the boundaries in the city, because <clears throat> I think, um, you know, Belfast is known because of its, uh, its lines of demarcation between people. And those lines exist 
almost in every city. So mm-hmm. how did you um, get people to come to the coffee shops? How did you initiate the conversations? So the coffee shops took place, as you said, uh, Marlon, in four parts of Belfast. We have North Belfast, which would be both Protestant and Catholic. South Belfast, which would be quite middle class. Yep. East Belfast, that would be working class Protestant. And West Belfast, that would be, you know, working class uh, Catholic, uh, nationalist, Republican. Yep. So the idea came from the board sitting around the table and we we're talking about compassion, just the way that the three of us spoke about compassion, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and I like what you said, Marlon, you said, you know, that both Leon and I were right in our interpretation of compassion. And that's what I love because everybody's right when it comes to their interpretation of compassion. You know, and what I can learn from listening to you and to listen to Leon talk about compassion, it adds to my understanding at another level of what compassion is. So whenever I, I went round to those four areas, North, South, East and West Belfast, first I went to North Belfast and we were very lucky, you know, the Reverend Bill Shaw, mm-hmm. who ran the Dunkern Arts Centre. So then, then Bill says we could host it in the, the Dunkern Arts Centre. And then because of Bill, right, on then the east side of the city, there's another similar venue called Skinos. And we approached them, uh, again, just to, to host this conversation around compassion. And they had opened their doors. And then we went to West Belfast, to a great venue in West Belfast, I think, uh, I think we were also there, so we were, uh, Marlon, and that was called the Culture Land in the west of the city. And again, you know, Culture Land opened up their doors, you know, to embrace uh, compassion. And then when it came to uh, the south of the city, we were able then to access Queen's University and to have uh, an open meeting there in relationship to, you know, compassion, what it is. And then what we found, Leon, was just like, like the three of us talking here, is that, you know, Nobody could own compassion. You know what I mean? So compassion was neither this nor that. You know, it is both this and that. And it's not only this and that, but it's also a bit more as well. Yeah. So then there's a joy. There's a joy, uh, Marlon, I would say, that whenever I approached uh, certain places, that the doors were opened. The doors were opened because they knew, and you know, and I know, we all know, you know, a good thing when we see it. Okay? And the good thing for me was that people were able to come together to explore the word compassion and what it means to them. You, yeah. you know, Marilyn, I'm so glad you're on this call on this call and able to co co lead this conversation because you've been there <clears throat> and you know to ask those questions. What I would also love to kind of point out in what you're saying is just that you work directly with the most important places in each of those communities. And it sounds like that was a very uh, big part of your strategy because you weren't necessarily an outsider coming in, you were in inviting folks in and people were welcome to that message. Correct, correct. And I also also believe beyond too, you know, that we have got great community leaders here. We have got great communities here doing, you know, doing fantastic work, doing amazing work. And that, you know, when you've been around a while in Belfast, then you know who those leaders are. And those leaders are well respected by their community, their respective communities. You know, and then by, uh, by contacting them, you know, they seem to give them the green light as to, yes, you can go ahead. You with me? Because again, remember, it's no one threatening. You know, we're not trying to take anything away. But if anything at all, we're going to be adding to. You're going to be adding to someone's life rather than rather than depriving people. Yeah, I love the non-threatening piece. Sorry, Marilyn, go ahead. No, no, I I was just going to reflect on, uh, you know, Bill's um, art building that he has, um, as as well as a community center, and it sits opposite. I don't even know what I could call it. it it's all fenced in with steel. Um, it's where the, uh, the occupation army uh, still exists. And so I was going to ask you, what place does art have in Compassionate Belfast? Because 
when you just look at Belfast, you go through the neighborhoods, you, you see all these signs of struggle, of oppression, of conflict, and, but art rings out. And I just wonder how the Charter uh, for Compassion Belfast uh, enhances that. Well, one of the ideas we came up with, with Jim, and by the way, I'm very impressed with your memory of, <laughs> of, of the Duncan. Yes, very much so. And I'm pleased to announce that that's no longer there. Oh, that, that's, okay. that's gone now. And uh, that's opened up. And because that was right on the border between, between uh, you know, in the, in the north of the city, right? Mm -hmm. There'd been a lot of conflict. So now, now that's, a, that's a walkthrough, you know, which mm -hmm. is a great sign. I mean, I think it was only about a week ago, maybe two weeks ago, in another part of the city over by the north side, you know, another peace wall has been taken down. You know, and again, you know, I mean, that just shows you now that we're starting to open up. Do you mean that the walls are coming down? Uh, you know, brick by brick, bit by bit, you know I mean, but it's going in the right direction. So when it comes to art, uh, we have someone who's going to be on our webinar coming out soon within the next couple of months, a guy called Colin Davidson. And if you could check out his TED talk, uh, that's C O L I N, Colin Davison, D I, sorry, D A V I D S O N. And he has a fantastic TED talk. And Colin had done lots of paintings, lots of portraits of people who had lost lives. No, it's, no, it's Colin C O C O L C O I N. C O L I N. Yeah, I can't correct that, so I have to do it over again. Okay, yeah. That... Thank you. Yes. And then we also we also know that every picture, you know, paints, you know, a thousand words. So one of the ideas that uh, that Jim Doley had come up with was, you know, let's go to the schools. So whenever Jim was here, he, he went to one of the uh, primary schools one of the integrated primary schools. And one of the things that he put forward for children was the playfulness of art, you with me? Mm -hmm. So it seems to be with that sort of that creativity, right? There's a playfulness, there's a lightness that comes around. So when I look across Belfast at the moment, you know, I now see masterpieces. I see masterpieces of art. You know, we've got new art now, you know, and I think, you know, the new art comes from what we have now, we have like a new deal when it comes to Belfast, yeah. Uh, down by down by the uh, down by the River Lagan, we have this beautiful big fish, which represents which represents the the salmon of knowledge, right? And within the scales of the big fish, you know, there are many many stories around Belfast, and I'm very pleased to see when I'm around Belfast is the amount of tourists to see the amount of tourist buses, right? packed with tourists to see the ships coming in, you know, the big, the big cruise ships coming in, you know, packed with tourists, you know, and with now being able to come into a city, right, where the art, you know, tells a thousand stories. The art tells a thousand stories. You know? So I would say, uh, Marlon, you know, I think the art of all art, I think the art of all art is obviously then the art of compassion. Yeah, the art of compassion. One of the things that we were doing over in the garden, uh, which Marlon mentioned in the Crescent Garden is, we're hoping to open it up like a Hyde Park at the weekend that there'd be, it would be sort of a lot of art being on display, you know, hanging on the rails around, around the garden, you know, up for sale. Yeah, but I would say yes, art has a big part to play in the restoration I mean, of, of a compassionate Belfast. I want to echo Atlanta is, is got a similar type of movement. And these are um, murals on buildings that have popped up everywhere. And it's a lot about Black Lives Matter or um, our history of our Black history that has not been displayed or shown. You know, we've had um, many Confederate monuments 
but none to civil rights. Well, there, there are a few, there are a few, but, but this art has really, um, as a tool of education is a really amazing, amazing thing. So I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, Marilyn, you do, you know so much about what's going on there. What have we forgotten to ask about? Well, I think it's not so much uh, what we've forgotten to ask about, but I think the future, um, I think the, the one thing that's so interesting, I think in Belfast is, is the fact of really getting people into conversation, as uh, Frank has said, because there historically have been so many divisions um, within the city. So I'm wondering, what are some of your future plans, Frank? You and the team, I, he has a marvelous team of people. Um, and I know that they have a lot of plans moving forward. Yes. Well, at the moment, at the moment, due to COVID, we're, we're meeting on Zoom and uh, we're putting together a webinar to, to, to take place. It'll probably probably not be until maybe about June or a bit later, right? Because we're just waiting for some funding to come through. But the webinar is really just to keep things alive, you know, because the conference was postponed, right? Uh, we thought that what we'll do is then we'll take it, take it to a webinar. And then in order to get the, the webinar, and the contents for the webinar, uh, like the likes of Tim Chapman and myself, uh, we are, you know, doing this fox pox, you know, throughout the city, asking people that great question as to you know what what comes to mind when you mention the word compassion. So that's that's a big one. That's in the pipeline. Uh, also, Jim Doty, I talked about, you know, the seeds, you know, for the for the schools, which is great. Uh, there's an, uh, another. A great lady who's also interested in and looking at addictions. So what we're going to do is we're going to run off a number of you know uh, webinars. So the first one will be like a, a large webinar, maybe about an hour, an hour and a half, and then what will spring from that will be looking at say the next week or the next month, uh, compassion and restorative justice. You mean, you know, what I mean? Uh, and then say the month after that, there we'll be looking at say compassion. And addiction, you know, there's a great, there's a great uh, neuroscientist called Dr. Judith uh, Grisell, who wrote a fantastic book called Never Enough, right? And uh, Judith Grisell, I think she's from Pennsylvania, you know, she has agreed then to come on board. And so what she's looking at, she's looking into the neuroscience of addiction. Yep. Mm. Again, it's all about getting the conversation. Is that right? It's all about, you know, getting the platform there to be able to talk about the things that we that we find difficult to talk about. So, you know, one of the things I hear is that there are certain areas, right? So addiction being one of them, restorative justice being one of them. And, and in many ways, those things, you know, addiction doesn't go after one community. It goes after every community. So it brings it down into a conversation that we can all have, and it doesn't matter what our religion is background our race is we we struggle with these things how do you decide what those things are going to be compassion is such a broad stroke how do you focus in on those different areas how do you choose those areas to focus in on i think it's a wee bit like uh did you ever hear that story about the starfish you know, where a guy's walking, you know that one? You know, the guy's walking on the beach and there's like a thousand starfish and, you know, he lifts the one up and throws them into the sea, another one into the sea, and then someone comes on and says, you know, this is, you know, census, this is, you know, uh, look at how many starfish there is, you know. And then the guy turns says, but it means a lot to this one. Mm -hmm. To be honest, to be honest, Leanne, I think that these things appear. Mm. I think that they appear. You know, we're not going to be, we're not going to be spreading ourselves thin, Right, but you find you find that, like at the moment, this other uh, doctor, Doctor Orla uh, Campbell, right, who's very much interested in, in in addiction as well and the history of Ireland. I mean, even more so. You know, you know, she's just recently appeared, you know, which is fantastic. So I think as we continue along the pathway, it begins then to open up, you know, and it starts to grow and it starts to flourish. But I, I do think I do think that uh, when it comes to 
the troubles that we experienced, I mean, and from the troubles, you know, we have the trauma of mm-hmm. the past. And you know that when it comes to addiction, you know, usually at the root cause of addiction is trauma. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. That helps me answer my own question because we've also got a lot going on here and people say, well, how do you decide what you're doing? And I'm like, well, it just comes to us, really. It does seem to surface that way. Well, you know, we have a question here from uh, Leanne's uh, co-director and I think you've partially answered it, but I'll read the full question and then you can see um, what else you want to add. So how is compassion being used as an intentional tool for healing, given the divisive history of Belfast? We in Atlanta can use your wisdom. As a tool. As a tool. As a tool, I would say, I think I mentioned this to Leon earlier on, you know, compassion does not include yourself. So it's an inside job. It's an inside job. Compassion does not include yourself. It's not compassion. So I would say to that, that great question is that the more that we're able to practice on ourselves, the more that, that we're able to be present to the suffering of others without avoiding. So I would say that the tool, the tool for me is to practice compassion. You know, and also, I also believe a wee bit like what Leon said there about hard things appear. But I also believe that the more that we practice, the more that we practice, then what happens is those who we meet and those who we greet, you know, can also pick that up as well. Go back to that, you know, the two candles, you know, where one lights the other, but the light is not diminished on the first candle. So it's about how can we light up each other? How can we light up each other? And that comes down to practice, 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 practice. Do it. Practice. Everything we do is practice. How we communicate here is practice. You know, how I sit in my seat is practice. You know, it. Uh, just to piggyback on that, I'm reminded of George Orwell, and you know, his saying that um, human beings have two ears two eyes and one mouth, and they should be used accordingly. Mm-hmm. So I think that, you know, when it comes to um, really being in communion with other people is listening. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, you know, that's one of the true tools of compassion is to listen. And then I think another tool of compassion is to ask, how can I help? And, you know, that, that brings you into hopefully solidarity with another person so that you can become allies uh, together. And I believe that when you become allies, um, you take direction. And so it, it's a tricky thing uh, with the Charter for Compassion movement uh, because you can come in with your own agenda, uh, but you know, it can be totally ignored. But if you come in listening and um, really maybe create together an agenda if possible, but maybe to take an agenda from others and help follow. So, so Marilyn, I want to um, maybe put out a little challenge. I think we often say, how can I help? Mm-hmm. And maybe we can say, how can I support you? Uh-huh. That's because... Yeah, it's something that we're constantly learning. And um, I, I spoke to a class at, at Emory's Rollins School of Public Health, and I said, okay, everybody, do you know the golden rule? That's what the charter is based on. And someone said, well, what about the platinum rule? Oh, yeah. Maybe I've told you this before. No, no, I no. Said, I said, what's the platinum rule? Well, the golden rule, treat others as you wish to be treated. The platinum rule is treat others the way they wish to be treated. Mm -hmm. So we come from different spaces. We come from different backgrounds. We have different trauma. So so asking that question, and this is something I I give to you as my learning space, right? Um, How can I support my neighbors? Because they, we we also talk a lot about asset-based community development, right? And so how do we go into a community that has a lot of assets? Now, I'm not the expert, they are. 
yeah. and how do we build that support? So, so I love the fact that Frank, you're taking it into the community. You're working with those community leaders. You're really, I mean, if the signs have come down that you were talking about, and that's now a thoroughfare for people to walk through, mm -hmm. that change is happening and it's happening mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that I've had to learn the hardest and I'm still learning about compassion and about change is to be patient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I want it now. I want to do it now. How can I help? How can I fix? And that's not necessarily how to go into this work. It's how can I be? How can I be with you? How can I support you in this community that we live in? We have I know, a... I, go ahead. No, Sorry. I was going to say, uh, just because the time is getting slim, uh, uh -huh. we have a wonderful, um, well, response, question, and offer. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is directed to you, Frank. Thank you for sharing your knowledge, wisdom, and compassionate heart through this webinar and to the people of Belfast. I'm loving hearing the work you're doing in Belfast through the lens of compassion. Have you done any collaboration with art therapists? I feel they would be able to support the work you're doing. I also have a few people who would be interesting in collaborating with you in relation to addiction. What would be the best way to contact you and your team? I'm sensing you're getting a new team member here. I'm a trauma <laughs> therapist and coach based in Belfast. Oh, oh fantastic. fantastic. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, I, think, I think the best way to contact would be courtesy of your good self there, Marlon, and you can yep. hook the person in. We'll do. I'll make an introduction to Hannah uh, <laughs> McKim, who wrote that, and uh, to you, and vice versa. So I know Actually, we're wrapping up. Frank, how do you want to how do you want to leave us today? Well, I'd like to leave you with the words of Leonard Cohen. You know, where you're sitting today, Leon, you know, with the sound of the birds, <clears throat> what came to my mind was, you know, the ability then to start again. You know, sometimes people feel as if they can't start again. Right? And what Leonard said was, he said, the birds they sang at the break of day. Start again, I heard them say. Don't hold on to yesterday or what is yet to be. Ring the bell, the bell that rings. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Beautiful, that is beautiful. Uh, Mary, anything else you want to share? Well, I was just going to remind people that uh, we do have it a lot in the chat room. Uh, and so um, please feel free to download it so it can be yours. Uh, and all you have to do is follow those, those three dots there and it'll tell you to, uh, to save the chat on the very top. And I did want to say a few things besides thank you so very much to both of you, especially Frank, uh, because of all the work that you're doing uh, in Belfast and Leanne and company in, uh, in Atlanta. Uh, there's, there was some reference to the golden rule uh, and we have our golden rule uh, webathon or web webcast coming up on April 5th. Uh, so just check out the charter pages or the newsletter so that you can tune in and see uh, how the golden rule is being practiced uh, around the world. And we do have a little segment about the platinum rule uh, as well. And please watch uh, the charter website uh, for our next, uh, we do these every month with a city. Uh, and we've been doing it for a little over a year. So, and they're all recorded and you can find them uh, on the charter homepage. So thank you everyone for coming today. Um, and I don't know if anyone wants to say anything more. Well, thank you both Marlon and Leon for being very kind and very soft and very gentle with me. <laughs> I, was, I was slightly terrified, you know what I mean? And... Uh, <laughs> And then to those who are watching, you know, I wish you all well and that you all be, you all be happy, free from suffering and the causes of suffering.
Very good. And there's one more request uh, in, in the uh, chat box about putting the words from Leonard Cohen. Uh, and they can be uh, gotten by just Googling, put uh, Leonard Cohen uh, in your Google Docs and write the birds they sang. It's quite a long um, poem, which was put to music. So uh, you'll find it there. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Thank you. I love the world getting together <laughs> in, in moments, right? This is the way how we're going to move forward. So thank you very much for having me be a part of this. Thank you. And there's an open invitation to Belfast, and you're all welcome anytime. OK. I'll get my Bye. mask. <laughs> Bye. Take care, Bye, everyone. everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.